everyone. Welcome to the Raven Fork Watershed in the Great Smoky Mountains and the Koala Indian Reservation. I'm Sam Johnson, one of your sponsors tonight, or one of your, your MCs tonight. I'm a partner in Wild Bearings, an, an, an outdoor products uh, company that sells everything from bamboo fly rods to cigars to mojo sportswear, flies, you name it. We've got a lot of things that um, we like to use out in the field. Uh, I'm also the author, author of Fly Fishing the Blue Ridge Parkway and um, I'm a pro guide uh, for Mojo Sportswear Company. So I get to fish a lot, especially in, in the rivers and streams in the Appalachians, and I have fished the Raven Fork Watershed a lot, and I'm looking forward to talking with you about it tonight. Our, our major sponsor tonight is Mojo Sportswear. Um, Mojo is an active lifestyle sportswear company. Uh, the newest and best technology that's out there today. If you're tired of wearing the same old, same old like Chris and I were, um, all we wear these days is Mojo Sportswear. Uh, a lot of microfiber fabrics, this moisture wicking, it's breathable, it's got vents, uh, quick dry stain resistant and antimicrobial, which means you don't stink when you get fish guts all over you all day. So it's durable, functional, very stylish. And whether you're on the stream, you're on the ocean fishing blue water, chasing marlin, or you're on a golf course, or you're in a highfalutin restaurant, um, Mojo Sportswear Company will make you look good and feel good. Um, go, so go to their website at www.mojosportswear.com. And if you see something you like, uh, punch in the WB10 discount code and get a 10% off. And I think you'll be very happy with what you see and I know you'll like it uh, when you're in the field. Um, Chris, let's talk about what we're going to to give us an overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about permits and licenses because you got to be a little careful up in this area sometimes, uh, depending on where you're fishing. Uh, we'll do a little bit of an at a glance. We'll talk about the four sections uh, that we're going to cover tonight, uh, maps, access, all that good stuff. Uh, bugs and gear, some local outfitters, got some great outfitters in this area, uh, and then uh, any Q&A along the way we'll be happy to address. Last thing I'll mention to you, if you want more information about the Raven Fork after this program tonight, uh, there's a book out uh, called Fly Fishing the Blue Ridge Parkway, and it, it does a deep dive on the Raven Fork and all of its tributaries. One of the most interesting and remote rivers, especially the upper part of it, that you're going to fish anywhere in the eastern part of the United States, perhaps uh, all over the United States. Um, a lot of parkway information, because this is a parkway watershed. Uh, we talk about the trout, the hydrology, uh, how to get to each of these waters, uh, really a lot of access detail, and descriptions of our experience on the water there. So um, we also, uh, things that I like, a lot of history, a little bit of lore about the locals and what they talk about, about the waters, uh, who are the outfitters locally, the lodging. Uh, and the most important things, you know, for a good watershed, I feel like you've got to have good lodging or camping. You've got to have some place to get food or, or to prepare your food and tobacco and alcohol. Those to me, those are the those are the prerequisites for a good watershed. So if you um, if you if you're interested, go to wildbearings.com and you can learn more about that book. Now, I looked at the um, the, the 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 participants that have joined from around the country. We have people from California, Maine, Minnesota, New York and Miami. We have them from all over the country. So what I want to start by doing is giving you a little bit of an overview uh, to give you a sense of where you are, because I know a lot of you fish this area and you may be familiar with this, but probably most of you have not been in this area. So the area in the middle, the oval shape there is basically the, the Smoky Mountains. And you see running through it is the Appalachian Trail, which really runs the spine of the Appalachian Trail. Uh, 441 coming from Cherokee, North Carolina, runs basically through the middle of the Smokies up to Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge, Sevierville, then hits Interstate 80 up here that runs over to Knoxville and Nashville, you know, all those kind of areas. 
South is the city of Cherokee, uh, which is in the Koala Indian Reservation. I'll give you more details of that in a few minutes. The watershed that we're going to be talking about today is a significant watershed in the 640,000 acres of the Smoky Mountain National Park, as you can see there. The dark blue area is, is, is the Raven Fork itself. The lighter blues are some, are just, just four of the major tributaries that we're going to talk about also, although not as in depth as we will the Raven Fork proper. So that's a general kind of an overview. It's on the south slope of the Smokies. Right in this area here is the Okona Lufty River. Probably most of you from this area have heard of this river, very famous river. It is a big watershed, but make no mistake about it. The Raven Fork often gets lost because it's, it's remote. And other than the bottom stretch that we're going to show you, most of this upper part most people have never fished because of the remoteness of it. But we're going to show you how to get there and what you'll see when you get there. Um, so that's about all I'm going to tell you about the overhead or about the overview. I did want to tell you a little bit about the licenses and permits that you'll need to fish because it, it can be it, it can look confusing, but it's really not. If you're on the Koala Re Indian Reservation, depending on where you're fishing, there are two permits that you will need. The tribal enter enterprise permit, you're definitely going to need. That's a $10 per day uh, cost. Or you can do a two, three, or five day at a reduced rate of a couple of bucks you know, per day. You can buy a, a tribal enter enterprise permit for annual for $250, uh, which if you fish up there a lot, that's a pretty good deal. Now, if you want to fish the 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 trophy section or the Parkway Haven trophy water, which is which is about um, about five miles roughly, I'll show you that. Um, it it is you're going to need a special permit for that, and that permit uh, it's going to sound like a lot, but it's really not because of the fish you're going to catch. It's twenty five dollars a day. Um, for and you can get one to three day permits, or you can do it for seventy five dollars a year. Depending on where you are on the reservation, you're going to need the tribal enterprise fishing permit covers everything. But if you're going to fish the trophy waters, you also have to have the the catch and release permit, and they call it by different names. But basically, they'll when you go to get your license, they'll know what you're talking about. Now. When you get out of the Koala Indian Reservation, all you need is a North Carolina or a Tennessee fishing license if you're in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And I'll give you kind of a general overview because I, I tell you, you don't want these dudes chasing you because they, they, they'll get after you if, if you don't. Several of the streams that I'm going to show you have sections that are closed to anyone but enrolled members of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indian Nation. Uh, so uh, unless you're unless you can prove that you're part of that group, you don't need to be on that water. And I'll show you where that water is. And it, all of that water is marked by these signs. Permits. But the main thing is don't um, don't fish. <laughs> don't fish there. Um, this is what the Indian Reservation looks like when it's embedded in the southern part of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Uh, uh, kind of looks like it was surveyed by the Spanish because it's at 45 degree angles up here. I don't necessarily understand that. But anyway, the Raven Fork comes out of the top of this screen and comes down into the Kuala Indian Reservation. The red area here is you cannot fish there unless you are a part of that of that of that Indian nation. The black area that tracks on down over eight miles down to this point, all you have to have is an enterprise fishing license, almost 8.8 .8 miles of open fishing right there that I call assisted living fishing. I mean, you step out of your car, walk down in the creek, and it's about a one to one and a half percent grade. Very, very easy and a lot of fish. We're going to show you all of that. The trophy section is this section right here. 
which starts at the starts at at the confluence of the Oconaluftee River and runs up a couple of miles to a campground. And that is where you'll need the, the catch and release permit there. Now we're not going to talk about any of this other water that's on this reservation, only the Raven Fork that I'm highlighting here. And one of the major tributaries coming off of that is 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 straight fork. The first part of that is also restricted until you get into the to the park, and then it's open fishing, and we'll show you that. And then this area right here, there's one area on on uh, Bunches Creek up to the up to the um to the the park boundary that's restricted several miles here and we'll, we'll show you that also so that's kind of an overview i know that's fast and and, and kind of general but a, as a rule you've got a lot of area to fish here and um and we really really think you'll have a good time uh chris why don't you talk about the the watershed as a whole well it, it's great fishing um it, it's a beautiful area all those areas that you mentioned as well Fantastic areas to fish. Uh, we have a five thumb rating on this. So if you get into the uh, fly fish in the Blue Ridge Parkway, uh, Sam has a very creative and uh, distinct way of rating his rivers. He put a lot of thought into it. He put a thumbs up. So thumbs up. Uh, five, five thumbs, great place. Uh, not a whole lot of gradient. Uh, very easy to navigate this water. Um, uh, all uh, pretty much. Um, all the species you're going to see in there. So the rainbows, browns, goldens, uh, even some specks. Um, if you get on up into, into the higher elevations and uh, just, just overall, just excellent quality fishing. The trophy section is a lot of fun. Uh, if you've never done that, you got to do it at least once uh, and, uh, and very accessible too. It's, it's very accessible. The lower two sections are parallel by a road, uh, literally yards away that you can drive and, and, and just walk down into the stream. Uh, something to keep in mind here, uh, the, the source of this creek or river that, that we're calling starts at 4,200 feet. Now, that's a big pool that I'm going to show you, a very rare and beautiful place, exotic place. But the three headwaters that come into there start at, at over 5,600 feet up right off the Blue Ridge Parkway and come down in there. So this is cold, clear, some of the clearest, cleanest water that you're gonna find anywhere east of the Rockies. So we rate it highly and uh, we thank you, um, we think you probably will too. Now there are four sections to this stream uh, and I'm not counting the headwaters. You got the left fork, the middle fork and the right fork come off the Appalachian Trail up there on the spine of the Smokies, comes down to about 4,200 feet. And we'll talk to you about these headwaters too in fishing those. And then section four, we call the upper section, is 4.2 miles from the pool where these three headwaters come together and flows down to an Ole Creek down here, uh, which is a, a, a very, uh, number one, it's difficult to get to and, and very technical to fish once you get there. We'll show you a lot of detail on that. And then section section three, we call the gorge section. We'll show you a lot of imagery there. Um, I have fished this section one time. It's 1.9 miles. It's, a, it's something you do not want to go into unless you have a friend uh, with you and, and preferably a transponding GPS where someone can track you and know exactly where you are. Because the only way you're going to get out of there if you get hurt the helicopter is going to come hover over you and drop a line to you because there is no place to land up in there. There are vertical rock walls in a lot of those areas there, but it is a very exotic place. And um, unless you've got some, if you've got someone you really don't like a lot, it's always bugging you to take you fishing, take them there because they'll never ask you again. Right, Chris? <laughs> yeah, and I, I probably bear spray is not a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> in this neck of the woods guys so uh, uh, uh bear spray or 470 nitro express one of the two can yeah. will handle most of the, the wildlife there yeah. uh section two we call the flatlands because starting right at the koala indian reservation line and the park line right here it runs for 8.8 .8 miles it's the longest section all the way down to where the trophy section starts as you can see in this satellite imagery a road 
literally mirrors it all the way up, all the way through Big Cove right here. And it's, it's an amazing place to fish. A lot of these, I always claim a lot of the trophy fish from down here, uh, you know, end up, mm -hmm. some of them upstream up here. It has three of the largest tributaries coming into the, the, the Raven Fork. It's got Mingo Creek, which in itself is not big. Bunches Creek, which is a big creek, and also Straight Fork, which is one of Chris and mine's favorite fishing mm -hmm. places to fish. We'll show you a lot about that also. And then finally, the last section, section one, we call the, the trophy section. It's 1.7 miles uh, until it, it, it runs into the confluence of the Acona Lufty River. This is a big river also. Both of these rivers, as you'll see with the the um, imagery that we'll show you later are about the same size. I mean, the, the, the Raven Fork watershed and the Kona Lufty watershed are, are very, very similar in size and, and topography. So they dump about the same amount of water together, and the Kona Lufty River basically doubles in size right at that point right there. Now, the 1.7 miles of what we're calling the trophy part of the Raven Fork, there's another half mile that goes down the Acona Lufty to the Blue Ridge Parkway Bridge. So I'm not including, or we're not including that, only the 1.7 miles of the Raven Fork proper. So what we're going to do tonight, Chris and I are going to or take you on a, a kind of a pilgrimage upstream with each of these sections, starting with, with section one, the trophy section, and kind of give you an idea of what it looks like and what you might expect to fish there. And then we're going to go to section two, three, four, and finally end up with the headwaters. And then we'll talk about bugs and then have a, a Q&A there. Um, real quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here on this, other than these are the really the, the, the tributaries coming into each of the sections that we consider even marginally fishable. fishable. Uh, Popper Hollow Branch on the trophy section. There are other tributaries, and I know that there's some of you that are out there that are, that are know more about this creek than we do, might argue with us and say, well, you know, you got several others. Well, you do, but we've never fished them. And, and they're small. So that's the reason we're listing the ones we have here. The flatland section, this 8.8 .8 miles, there are three creeks on there, Mingo Creek, Bunches, and Strait, that are the three largest that you're going to see. In fact, this is Bunches Creek coming into the Raven Fork here. And you can see it's about five yards across. It's a pretty good, pretty good sized creek uh, when it comes in. And it's a great fishing creek also. Um, the other creeks that 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 I would you know if I were to you know talk to you about those two that would be Pigeon Creek and Gallimore those are pretty good sized creeks I've just never spent a lot of time on them and I and I don't know about you Chris have you have you fished either one of either Pigeon or no. Gallimore no I have not it seems They're, like we always uh, end up in our typical places I got to tell you I fish past the the confluence of those creeks coming in and I'm catching so many fish in the in the Raven Fork you know I always stand and I look up it and I think I should and then I don't and I keep yeah. going but all of you might uh, the gorge section there's really only one creek coming into the very top of it and this is a famous creek if there's any, if there's any of these creeks that People would drive a stake in the ground and that, that are, are wild fish chasers, especially uh, brook trout, would be in low. Um, and it, it is it's a very special creek uh, to fish. And we're going we're gonna to show you that creek also. The upper section, uh, I, these are really small creeks coming in, but there, there's not a lot of volume coming out of that. And then the headwaters being the three creeks that we talked about, the left fork is the, is the only, I fished about 100 yards up the right fork and left fork about a mile. And I'm going to show you some images of that also. So that's kind of what the tributary system looks like. All of these are easily found on, on, on topo maps. If, if you don't have a good topo map, this is a good one to go. Um, well, to give you an idea on the trophy section, then Chris, I want to turn it over to you because you're the trophy section fisher, not me. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I like chasing wild fish. And I don't know about that, but I, it, I, I this like is like fish. this is like shooting fish in a barrel. To, but to it's me. not that easy. It's really not. I mean, you, 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 you know, you got to have some technique. So because 
uh, as you saw with that big brook trout that I was holding in the beginning, um, that that the water is crystal clear. Um, it's beautiful water. There's typically several fish holding there, but they're not easy to catch. Uh, you you got to have the right entomology on, right bugs on, uh, and uh, and and you got to know where you're going on this watershed. So it it is. Uh, I tell you, uh, it, uh, several years ago, I fished it with the first time with a with a guide. Uh, with the uh, uh, fly fish and smokies, Eugene, uh, and uh, a great guide service, uh, and, and highly recommended. And uh, and we bounced all over this thing. We did a full day, bounced all over, and hit hit a number of different spots. Uh, but you know, anytime you see uh, trophy section or fish a trophy section, uh, those fish are pretty particular. They see a lot of bugs, uh, and and you gotta you gotta know kind of what to fish and when to fish it. And the right time of day to fish those bugs, um, or, or you're not going to catch any fish. But it's just as simple as that. You know, the, the saving grace, Chris. Uh, you know, they are picky and it can get technical. But it's 1.7 miles of what I call assisted living fishing that has yeah. a road has a road paralleling it. You step right down in the creek. It has a one tenth of one percent grade. Which over it drops a hundred only a hundred feet in 1.7 miles. I mean, you could fish this in a wheelchair. It's that, it's that easy. Um, the confluence is right here on the Acona Lefty. We're going to show you that in a minute. And then it runs right in front of, of the school, school systems here. Um, uh, just an amazing, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, school, uh, facility right here. You'll go right past. And then you, then you get into basically other than an occasional cabin up here, um, and then you come around the curve in the River Valley Campground, where, where the entrance to really River Valley Campground peels off of, of um, the road there, you, Big Cove Road, is where it stops. And there are signs there, so you can't really miss it. So that's, that's kind of uh, what it looks like from the air. Um, this is typical of what you're going to catch on this stream, Chris. Yeah, it's, I'm telling you, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's worth, it's worth the expense of the, the stamps that you need to fish it. Um, and that's right there. Uh, you know, a beautiful area, big pool. Um, so even if you're new to fly fishing, it's a great area to fish because it's pretty wide open. Uh, and you can get some good, some nice casting in. Uh, and, uh, but it's, it's shallow, you know, it, it's, it's not that deep right there. It's, it's maybe a foot and a half, uh, you know, maybe two feet at the most. Uh, and, and it is crystal, crystal clear. So uh, very technical in this area. Yeah, it's interesting thing, these golden trout um, yeah. that they've planted. Yeah. There, you know, all, all these fish that we normally chase, like this brook trout and rainbows and browns, you don't see those. You rarely do you see them. But these guys right here, you can see them 15, 20 yards in front of you. Yeah. Uh, and, and get a feel for where they are, and then and, and, and then cast to them. So it's, and they're hard to catch. The, yeah. you know, the banana chasing ain't easy. I can tell you. You'll spend a lot of time casting to a banana, and, and you're lucky if you get one. So yeah, you you really will. Um, yeah. Well, this is a, this is an image of the confluence of this is the Raven Fork here coming into the Acona Lefty River, shot from the 441 Highway side here several years ago and um this angle really doesn't do the raven fork justice because it's almost as wide as the cone lefty right here yeah. in fact when you look at this satellite imagery from a geostationary satellite out in space i drilled down as tight as i could well almost as tight as i could get but this is the cone lefty coming down this is the raven fork coming in and you can see they're basically the same size as they come into it, there's the school over here, and there's the road paralleling it all the way up. So I mean, you got really great um, area. This is the road about a mile up and over the uh, the, the school. Uh, this is the uh, Big Cove Road going across right here, and this is generally what it looks like. This is actually a little higher water right here. Yeah, that is a little higher water. Yeah, than you normally see, but this is very fishable. And um, Chris, you've had some encounters with these boys right here, haven't you? Well, you know, I, I like to sing to them. I tell you, the last time I was up there, and and and, and really cautionary, uh, is is a uh, we were going up 
actually to Bradley Fork. Um, and uh, there was a bunch of cars, police, side of the road. And, and this bad boy right here, and he's a, sta he's a staple, right? He's there all the time. And that bad boy got into a uh, Toyota Camry and he flat tore the side of it up. And then a guy in a Toyota Tundra decided he was going to stop and help. And his Tundra got torn up. So, <laughs> you know, caution. Uh, the, these, these bad boys are real. And I can tell you also, you got to be real careful because you can be fishing and all of a sudden these things will walk up behind you. So you really need to be aware of what's going on in this area. They, they usually won't bother you, but, but uh, you just need to be aware. Especially during the rut season, if you see a bunch of cow, cows around, uh, these these are beautiful animals, and you have a tendency, like bear, to want to get pictures and everything. But these things can hurt you really bad, so just be careful. Chris, we had a question uh, from yeah, Ryan. Do we, need a, do we need a Cherokee permit below the confluence of Ravens Fork and the uh, Kona Lufty? I don't think so. Uh, Chris, I th I, my understanding is when you look at the the the, the permit um, site. Yeah. My understanding is if, if you're on the, the trophy water, the half a mile that is the Oconaluftee yeah, yeah, River, yeah. you've got to have the enterprise yeah. permit also. Now, right. you, can, you can double check that. Um, I would, I mean, just, just to I, have it. I think the general rule is if you're standing in the Raven Fork, you better have a permit. Yeah. Uh, well, you better have permit, but if you're, if you're, in, if you're where the, tr the half a mile below the confluence, where the Raven Fork comes into the Ocona Lufty down to the Blue Ridge Parkway Bridge, my understanding is that you you need both permits in yeah. there. So you may uh, you may you may ask when you call. I, that's a good question, and quite frankly, yeah. I can't give you a definite answer. The, the uh, police, I've got both I've got both permits, so I'm okay. But you may want to check yeah, that. The, the police are not forgiving. No, they will right. They were in their average a hundred dollars a ticket. Yeah, they're, they're not forgiving. They 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 don't. They just say, "Hey, nice to see you. Here's your ticket." Um, and yeah. then and then if you push back, they're going to carry you off to jail. Just no quite don't and don't keep the fish. <laughs> keep the fish. You're yeah, really. Yeah, trophy this water is, starts this, at the BRP bridge. Yeah, yeah. This is an image, uh, satellite imagery showing the Blue Ridge Parkway. How close you are. There are places you're only about thirty yards. At, at toward the end, this is within a mile of the end of the Blue Ridge Parkway. The 469th mile is what you're looking at here, as it as it as it gets ready off the bottom of the screen to hit Highway 441. But look at the Raven Fork. Look at look at Big Cove Road, which parallels it all the way up to Big Cove, 8.8 .8 miles. Um, the river is just running parallel to it, and it it is flat. It's easy to get into all the way up to the campground right here where, where it ends and then the and then and then the, the flatland section starts right here. So it's a beautiful it's a, it's a beautiful, easy place to fish. Um, th this is a you know typical rainbow, about a 14, 15, 16 inch rainbow right here. Um, and this is you know this is the kind of stuff that you'll catch on there. Um, and this is uh, Chris. This is your buddies out here upstream from you. I, that that that's a picture we took that day that I that that, that I was catching those brook trout and uh, boy, he's gorgeous, just beautiful. What a beast! That's, that's pretty cool to be fishing um, in an Indian reservation on a yeah. wild and furious stream like this and have a, a bull elk stag elk up there in front yep. of you like that. Yeah. That's just amazing. And then you see this, right? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you, if you, if you're going to see fishermen on any part of the Raven Fort, you're going to see it in the trophy section. Once you get up into the flatlands, uh, you get into the gorge and the upper, the other three sections, you're not going to see that many people. You're certainly not going to see them standing around like this. You may see someone a half a mile up the Creek, but, um, th this, uh, especially during weekends and holidays, uh, look at the water clarity here. This this water is about a foot and a half, eighteen, maybe maybe two feet wow. deep. In some of these some of these areas over against that, uh, where it may be a little deeper on the outside of a curve, it'll drop down two or three feet maybe. But generally, that's what you're looking at when you fish this part of the river. Um, that's all, Chris. You got anything else on the trophy section? No, it's just, you should experience it. You know, it's a, it's a great, great fun place to fish. 
Uh, we can talk about bugs in a minute, you know, that, that, that are good in that area. Um, but uh, j just a lot of fun, a lot of fun to fish in November, you know, when the leaves are kind of all falling off. Um, it, it's beautiful, kind of bundle up a little bit and go chase some trout. A lot of fun. It, it really is. Yeah. Let's talk, let's talk about um, section two, the flatland section. This is the 8.8 .8 miles from the end of the trophy section, which is right down here, all the way up uh, through the big cove area to the, the boundary line of the, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park and the Koala Boundary. And it, it, it looks something like this. It comes all the way down flows right here to the trophy section, and it has those three tributaries that are fishable. Uh, the reason I, we're going to show them to you tonight, Mingo Creek, which is the smallest, and really, you got a falls right here, um, and, and I fished up to probably about a half a mile um, above the falls area, but it's a pretty good-sized watershed, but it's not that big of a creek, and we'll show it to you. Uh, Bunches Creek is a huge watershed and a very, very fun, exotic place to fish. When yeah. it goes into the, the National Park, you would think you're in Ireland or Scotland chasing fish. It's so green and mossy up there. Just beautiful. Uh, and then Straight Fork up at the top up here that goes to the boundary right where there's a fish hatchery for the Koala Indian Reservation. When, once you pass that, you're going to go into the National Park. Uh, and it curves and goes further up here. So this, this is a lot of water to fish. I'll show you in a minute going through the big area. And the first part of the straight fork is, is tribal fishing only. And I'll show that to you and explain that to you in just a minute. Um, this is a, a, an image we took just above the trophy section, above the campground, right before uh, you, you, you get to Mingo Creek. Again, there's the road. There's power lines, and there's this beautiful river coming down with these dark undercut banks um, and shallow water on this side. It's just, it's really easy to fish. This is all supposedly wild fish up here, although a lot of these trophy fish migrate up here. You can catch big and small fish. There are little brown trout there, typical little 12, 13 inch brown trout that, that, that you'll see. Um, up about a mile, roughly, uh, and Chris, I don't know. I don't know if you fished Mingo before. I haven't fished um, Mingo. No, I, I'm 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 a bit embarrassed sometimes to show this creek because when it comes under the road on the other side of Big Cove Road, there's the bridge you can cross over uh, to another frontage road over here because you have a road going down both sides of the river here. Mingo Creek cuts under a, a culvert here, a pipe, and you can see from the flow here. I mean, it's not a huge amount of water coming through there, but it still holds a good population of, of, of rainbows and brooks above the falls over here. About a quarter mile um, from this area, this is where you just were looking at that culvert. There's a waterfall right here. I'll show you. Uh, most people stop fishing there because it's a, it's a booger to get around this falls. You have to hike around it. I don't, it, uh, I don't recommend climbing over it. And I've only fished up to this confluence right here where the water gets really small. And, and also gets, um, you get a lot of uh, drop pools and pocket water there and catching uh, small fish, another little brown uh, that was up there um, uh, at the, actually, this was at the falls. And that's what the falls looks like. It's tall. Uh, it, it was, you know, it's not a drop waterfall. It kind of slides down the front of that face right there. A pool at the bottom, which always holds fish, and then you got a lot of debris after, like you do under most waterfalls there. Uh, and then, you, and then we're we're bringing you back now to the Raven Fork. This is right above the Raven Fork here, uh, right above uh, Mingo Falls. And you can see the river, how beautiful it is. And again, there's a road on both sides behind these trees. Uh, and you can see the shallow, you see the clear water, the undercut banks under the brush over here. And it's just a, it's a great place to fish sandbars or gravel bars up here. That's what it looks like all the way up. A really nice brown um, trout up there. I don't, I'm assuming this was a wild fish, but it, it looks like it could have been a, one of the fish out of the trophy section to me that just hadn't gotten that, gotten that big yet. Um, Chris, this is 
one of your favorite creeks, Bunches Creek, that comes in about about halfway up that eight mile section, comes in on the right. That's unbelievable. It's gorgeous, and and you're not going to see too many people up there. Well, you're really not, and um, you can see how pretty it is coming in, how clear that water is. This is where the image was just taken right here, mm -hmm. uh, as it comes in right past that bridge, and it comes all the way up a couple of miles. And then this red area here is enterprise um, enroll members only, and this is well marked up here. And it's marked all the way to the road turns away and curves up here and goes up to the Blue Ridge Park. This is the Blue Ridge Parkway here. And it goes up to there, but it, the, the enterprise fishing stops there. Um, last year, Chris and I, mm -hmm. um, th th there's, there's an area to park up here, and you can, you can hike. Um, up into this area across the boundary. All you need is a North Carolina fishing license up there and, or, or a Tennessee fishing license all the way up uh, into this area. And it is just beautiful, beautiful water, uh, mostly rainbows and brooks until you get to the headwaters and you get into more brooks up here has been my experience. I have, I have not fished any of these tributaries. These are very small. Um, they appear to be fishable, at least in the in the in the drop pool areas that 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 you can get. Um, just be careful on private property because you can see here there is some private property, but there's a road that parallels it that you can go up and get up get get into um, the Kuala Reservation land and and chase it too. I, I'm betting there's brook trout in the headwaters of all these streams here just because of the elevation. Mm -hmm. uh, but Bunches Creek is a, is a fine creek. Uh, this is where it turns to open fishing. This is uh, kind of where Chris and I started fishing. We forded here and went across and, and went up from there. That's kind of what the creek looks like. It's not big, but you see there's a lot, very lot of fishable water in drop pools all, all the way up. Um, a little brook trout. Uh, gosh, that, that picture's 10 years old. Uh, that was caught probably two mile, two and a half miles up from where uh, into the park. Um, and there's a road up there you can take out, actually. Now, when you come back down from um, Bunches Creek, about a mile or so up, up river, Raven Fork takes a sharp left up into big, the Big Cove residential area, which is a loop road. And, it, and, it, and the road forks and also goes right, and it tracks along Straight Fork Creek which is probably, in, in my opinion, the largest, it is the largest tributary of, of the, the Raven Fork. And I know this is one of Chris's favorite creeks too. And so awesome. we're going we're gonna to show it and kind of show this is from that bridge toward the fish hatchery. You can see the size of the creek. I mean, it's, it's almost as big as the Raven Fork itself. This is what it looks like. This is the bridge where we just went left into the big cove area, turn right. You're going to track all the way up to a hatchery right here, which is which is owned and operated by the Koala Indian Reservation. And this is all the stocking fish, my understanding, the, the fish that they stock with down in town on Soco Creek and all the other areas um, uh, in, the, in the enterprise areas. This is where they come from. You, you'll drive right by that. Uh, go through the gate into the Great Smoky Mountain National Park up here. And you can see that this is a big watershed. It is, it's almost 11 miles long, uh, all the way up to the headwaters up here. And um, I, th th if you want some really good fishing that's not, that's not crowded, um, this is the place to go. Last time Chris and I were up there, we put in about right here above the fish hatchery. Mm -hmm. Right past the line, right past that yeah. big hornet nest that almost got after us, yeah. and and fished all the way up around this curve. Now, I'm assuming this is where Straight Fork got its name because it is straight. I mean, right here, you you get in some areas like this, you can see 200 yards up the creek. It is paralleled by the the um, Far Service Road all the way up. Which I think right during the winter time or at some point they close the gate, so you have to walk. I can't remember when that closure is. 
you need to check and if you're going up there just to fish straight fork you need to make yeah. sure that that gate is open and uh, you can do that through the national forest service website they tell you where those gates are and, and which ones are open this road goes all the way up and circles back above bunches creek and connects into the blue ridge parkway uh, this is a two-way road once you get up to the bridge i'm going to show you in just a minute it, it's only one way and it's downhill so you can't you can't go out that way, but you can come down from the Blue Ridge Parkway. Now uh, we, had a, we had a question. Was uh, Scott a question? Are North Carolina and Tennessee licenses reciprocal or just in the national park? Uh, my uh, just in the national park, as far as I understand. Yeah, That's I, the only, I, only only time I've ever used it. it I don't know. I always always have uh, an up to date Tennessee and North Carolina, Georgia, and you know. So I I don't. That's a good question. Um, I, I would assume just just have both. North Carolina is pretty inexpensive. Tennessee's outrageous. <laughs> it but, is. But I, I'm I'm almost, I'm almost sure in the park either either uh, either one is applicable. So you're safe if you've got one or the other. Right. I'm not I'm not sure about the other parks or other waters north north or south of there. But uh, Great Smoky Mountain National Park they split it because it's a national park. Yeah. Um. When you get up to, uh, you get up several miles up Straight Fork, you can see Straight Fork coming in from the bottom right corner right here. This is what uh, they call um, the Million Dollar Bridge, which this bridge is washed out a bunch of times. And I finally, the, the Forest Service, the Park Service got picked and decided they were going to build a way. And this one's been there quite a while. Um, this is where the river goes wild. From here, there's basically no trails for the remaining six miles, uh, five to six miles up to the headwaters. Great fishing, but you're basically going to be wading the creek up and back. So just make sure that if you're going to fish up it and you get all excited like I do and lose your head and just keep fishing around every corner, remember, you got to come back down that creek too. That's the only way down. Um, the road continues on across this bridge. And there's a turnaround up there, and it's met by the one-way road coming down from the Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, another little brook trout, or not, a little brown trout, pretty little fish with those red spots. Um, now, this is Straight Fork we just talked about. We come, we're going to come back now to the Raven Fork, and we're going to head up into a little residential area called the Big Cove area. This road goes and comes up here and circles and comes back down. There's a fish hatchery too here. I'm not sure whose fish hatchery this is or what they do with it, but there's one hell of a big fish hatchery in there um, and a lot of residential areas in there. This is, this, is, this is still Indian Reservation behind this dotted line right here, but this is all no fishing for you, or at least if you're not you enrolled uh, Cherokee Indian Nation, uh, all the way up to the line here on Straight Fork from the bridge, and then all the way up through Big Cove to this point here, which is where the gorge section, section three, will start. But this is um, great fishing all the way up here. Don't worry about not being able to fish here. You know, Chris, I, I think I've got, when I did my DNA, I had like 3%. Cherokee Indian. Oh, okay. you know, I, I tell you, I, I thought about, you know, going to and trying to see if I could get a permit to do it, but I'm, you know, I, well, you, I, there's I, a Senator in Massachusetts. You can call for help on that. So yeah, prob, probably. <laughs> so uh, I may get uh, after a couple of scotches one day do that. Yeah. Um, okay. So here we are. This, this is the end of that. No fishing area. Uh, this is the line between the National Park and the Koala. This is section three, what we call the gorge. This is a section that I'm not recommending that you fish. But if you do decide to fish it, you need to carry someone with you, maybe two people, and as well as have a transponding GPS where people can know exactly where you are because this is dangerous water for a lot of reasons. Number one, you have in many areas vertical walls on both sides of you that you're not going to climb up and out of. There are no trails through here. I have never seen even an animal trail going through there. Um, there are rocks, and I'll show you some of these in a minute, that I took that are as big as buses 
in the road in in the in the river that you've got to find a way around. Now it's it's great fishing uh, because nobody goes in there. I guarantee you, the, you're only going to catch br rainbows and brooks in there. But every fish you catch, when you bring them to hand, they're going to look at you like, "What the hell? Where'd you come from?" Because they've never seen anybody. Um, let me go back just a minute. It comes and it ends right here at the Inlow Creek Trail, which is one of the access trails for this area, especially up into the into the upper section that we'll show you in a minute. This hey, is Sam. Yes, another sir. question. Did, can you park at the loop to access a national park water? That that is a great question, and and the, the answer to that is if you ask permission of some of the homeowners that are along there, and there are a lot of them. That loop trail, you'll pass a bunch of houses. It'll take you right to that boundary, but you have to have permission to park your car. Don't do it. Don't do it because you will get towed or worse if you do that. And now we'll we'll talk about how to get into the upper part of it in just a minute when we when we get into the the upper section. But this section, uh, this is a geostationary image from out in space. I didn't enhance this at all. Uh, this is the start of the section right here. And even from space, you can see the falls and the huge drop pools and boulders that litter this gorge all the way up to Inlow Creek right around this curve right here. And as you can see, there are no trails to get out of there. And uh, you, you, if you're going to go up, you're going to come out the same way probably. I through fished it about 18 years ago was the only time I've been in here, and I, it took me two days to go 1.9 miles. And, and I didn't spend a lot of time working each of the holes. I spent most of my time trying to figure out how the hell, how am I going to get around that rock or that waterfall or a pool that goes from rock lead, rock wall to rock wall, and it may be 10 feet deep. That's why so, you have a new hip. <laughs> that's why I have a new hip, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> Now, this is also a geostationary satellite image of that same area uh, that I drilled down. And, you know, like this rock right here, it's hard for you to get a perspective of that, but this thing is as big as three or four pickup trucks. It's that big. Now, it's not in the middle of the river, but this one is. <laughs> and it's almost vertical where the water slides over it, you know, coming down. And the rest of the way, it is just drop pool, plunge pool. There are very few runs in this section, it's just one drop pool or big waterfall after the other, like right here. This is a slide that's probably 40 feet high that slides down into this drop pool. And you can see this dark pool right here. And here's a boulder right here that you got to figure out how to get around. A lot of logs, a lot of litter that you'll see in there. Um, it is, if you've got a taste for wild fishing, exotic fishing, dangerous fishing, then this is for you. But just be forewarned that you need to be very careful and let people know where you are because it's just possible you may not come out of there. Mm -hmm. um, this is an image of that area. This is an image I took probably, well, about 18 years ago. Uh, you can see the beautiful water. Uh, this water is crystal clear, ice cold, even in the middle of the summer because there are no roads, trails, or anything for any effluence or sediment to get into this creek. And this went in, over into a huge little, I called it a mini lake, that was probably 15, 18 feet deep in there. And you have to dredge that out, of course, with streamers and, and woolly boogers and weight it down uh, to get to the bottom there. And, and of course, you can see this, this little slide pool coming down in there. It's just a beautiful, beautiful place to fish. I mean, I caught this little rainbow at the bottom of this, 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 this slide here. And, you know, I'm not taking a lot of glee in this because at the same time I was trying to take this picture, I was asking myself, how am I going to get around that and, and, and get up the next 40 feet of this creek? And I got a mile and a half to go. Um, another image, very similar, very beautiful up into this area. Uh, huge amounts of deadfall that come down here, you'll, you'll see log jams. Chris, kind of like you and I saw last year on the Doe River up in oh, Tennessee, man. that the, literally the entire river would be jam packed with logs. Yeah. And you got to pick your way through them or climb around them 
it, to get into the pool above them and keep going. But as you can see, it's just a magnificent place to be, but it's just a place that if you're going to be, you better be real careful. A uh, little brook trout, this is not, a, this is, I mean, this, this is not a rarity. This is what you're going to catch. Uh, these a little bit bigger, up to about seven, eight inches is about the biggest I've caught up there. I know they're bigger ones, according to a lot of the reports. Um, this is Raven Fork coming from the bottom of the screen up to its terminus point at campsite, uh, backcountry campsite 47. And when we say backcountry campsite 47, that's just what, what we mean. There are no showers. There are no camping pads. There are lots of bears and animals up there, and it's rustic camping in every sense of the word. There is an old steel bridge here crossing that lets you get across the creek here on in, in Inlow Creek Trail. This comes from Smoke Mott, uh, the Smoke Mott area. You can come in from that way several miles hard hike here, or you can do about a, a rough, it's about three or four miles down to uh, Straight Fork Road. Uh, we'll show you that trail in just a minute. This is the famous creek that everyone talks about. I think it's a fun creek to fish. I, you know, I've never, I mean, I don't get all emotional about it, although a lot of people do. People have written volumes and, and do programs like this on Inlow Creek. Uh, it's known as a brook, brook trout creek. Uh, it, is, it is fun to fish. It is, it is a, lot of, a, a lot of fish in that area. Um, I fished it up. I fished it up. This is the, the confluence coming into the Raven Fork here, right below the campsite, kind of what it looks like, this, this tame right here. Um, and as it gets up from the campsite, it gets up here to, to a, a, its largest tributary, which is fishable also, but small, called Hideaway Creek. And I've never fished past Hideaway Creek. So other than some of the reports I've gotten further up, going a couple of miles up, um, Hideaway Creek is, is as far as I've gone. And you're going really northwesterly is, is the way this creek runs. And there's nothing but one trail, Enlow Creek Trail, that comes over from this valley, which is Smokemont, and uh, it comes over and cuts over here to the campsite and keeps going up to Hyatt Ridge over there. So Sam, I, I think something we got to touch on too is is know your weather forecast. Absolutely. Okay. If you're if you're up in this area, uh, you you really need you can get blindsided with with the storms that come over these mountains, and and you can get trapped. It can be dangerous. Uh, so so absolutely, uh, know your weather patterns. Know what the rain forecast looks like, because uh, you you can get trapped for sure. Yeah, a flash flooding, especially in the gorge area. Uh, I, um, it, when, when you're fishing any of this water uh, above above uh, the Big Cove area, which is the gorge area down here, or what we call in the last section, or Enlow Creek, you need to be listening and paying attention to what's happening up on the Blue Ridge, uh, up on the Appalachian Trail, about ten miles above you. Because if there's a big storm up there and you hear lightning and everything happening up there, you, you need to pay attention to what's happening upstream because there's a there's a good chance you're going to get a wall of water coming down this creek and you better be ready to head for high timber. And the problem there is, as, as Chris mentioned, is that some of these some of these areas of the creek are so steep on both sides, you're not going to climb out of them. And so at that point, you know, it's like the old days back in the 60s, you know, when the atomic bomb thing, you, you bend down, tuck your head down and kiss yourself goodbye because you're getting ready to wind up in the Oconalefti River a few days later yeah. in, in pieces. Um, this is um, right below the confluence of, of Hideaway Creek. Uh, this is pretty typically of what, what uh, of my experience fishing up um, in low. Uh, it's a pretty little creek, a lot of water, uh, a lot of brook trout hiding in here, a lot of drop pools. It's a it's a pretty creek. Um, this is a little brook trout. I mean, you know, I mean, it's kind of what you catch. I mean, it's nothing special. Um, I've never caught anything bigger than probably a seven, eight inch up there. Um, but in Low Creek, if you have time, uh, hike in there and fish it. You'll enjoy it. The last section of the 
of the uh, Raven Fork, we, we call the upper section because it's, it's, it's 4.2 miles. And it, it, although it's only a 3% average grade, it only dropped 675 feet over that 4.2 4 miles. But I describe it as kind of a, a, a Jekyll Hyde stream because the bottom half of this is very much like the gorge section, a little flatter, but it is very rugged with huge boulders, a lot of deadfall, chugging the stream, but a lot of really good fishable water. Once you get above, you get about halfway up this, it opens up and you would think you're in Wyoming or Colorado somewhere. And I, you'll probably agree with me when you see the pictures. So you got the background country campsite here, we're gonna show you in a minute. Access trail coming into this. If you don't want to hike up through here, <laughs> through the gorge, you can from Smoke Mott, you can hike up and, and, and join the Inlow Creek, uh, Inlo Creek Trail and come in here. Or you the straight road over here, you can take the Hyatt Ridge Trailhead, which is a couple of miles up here, and there's a trail junction here where you'll pick up Inlow Creek Trail and go down the ridge. To a, to a group of switchbacks right here that'll take you to the bridge where you can either jump in the river or you can cross, go to the campsite, or you can go up Inlow Creek, either one of those. Um, and so that's um, it's kind of a kind of a view of that area. This, this is this is some this is some this is some of the most remote trout fishing you're going to do in the eastern part of the United States. There's nothing above you but the Appalachian Trail. Uh, about four miles up, four or five miles up. Uh, it is it is a very very beautiful place. Um, according to everyone that I've talked with and everything I've read, um, this entire area was so rugged, including the gorge, that the Ritter Lumber Company and the the lumber company that 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 did Smoke Mott over there, the the paper company down in in. Uh, down the mountain, um, they didn't log this area completely. They did take some select trees out of here, but they couldn't get trains uh, and trucks and things like that to, to really clear cut it. So what you're going to see is a lot of this. The, the, this, this tree right here was all, almost 10 feet in circumference going around it at chest high. And I understand on this particular, this is a, I think a black balsam that I think like 12 and a half feet is the, like the record in the eastern half of the United States. This, they're everywhere like this. This is the campsite. This is camp, this is, is backcountry campsite 47 here. Other than having a fire ring here that the National Park Service put in here, that's it. But it's beautiful. This is looking upstream there. And this is the old, um, metal bridge, bridge that Enlow Creek Trail comes across. Now, the biggest fish I've caught on this stream was right under, right, right up from this bridge, right in front of this log jam and this rock, which is big as a darn pickup truck, um, is where I caught the largest brook trout that I caught in this upper or the gorge area right here. So this Damn. is this is what this is what you'll expect to see in that in that area where the trails come together. Do you reserve a campsite up here? Yes. Uh, I think there's seven or eight sites here. I, I don't know what the hell a site is. You know, I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, but they don't want more than seven, I think seven or eight tents in here at one time for, I guess, obvious reasons. But you go online uh, with with the um, uh, uh, Smoky Mountain National Park site in the camping, and you can reserve that. I've never seen a ranger in there. I mean, I, it's not like anybody's going to come check you. Uh, they probably do at some point, but I've never seen, well, I've never seen another human there when I was there. So um, I, you probably need a, you probably should get a permit just to be legal. Um, this is looking up from the bridge. This, this is where I caught that brook trout right, right in this pool right here. Um, and, and you can see the rocks, the size of these rocks are just massive. As this goes, this is very typical of the first two miles of what we call the upper section right here, what it's going to look like. You're not going to see any sandbars. It's all just gravel and rock because there's no sand. 
There's no effluence coming in from roads or erosion or anything like that. that there's the brook trout I was telling you. This is an inch longer than the handle on this particular bamboo rod, which is six inches, and he was about seven. Uh, pretty little fish. Nice little red spots. Wow. He's fat. He is fat. Uh, well, there's a lot of bugs up there, is my understanding. Um, about one and a half miles below the source that I'm going to show you, this is a satellite imagery showing the You can see these steep walls right here. This is almost a vertical wall right here covered with laurel and um, turkey toe and gallac all over the top. It's just a bald up there. It's just beautiful. I've always wanted to go up there, but it's, it'd be such a, a pain in the butt to do it. But you can see the ruggedness of this stream that is it zigzags around the topography here. And this is totally natural topography that's never been altered uh, by man. Um, as you get above that a ways, a, a, about another a, a, a half a mile, this is what you get into. You, you'd think you're someplace in, in Wyoming, you know, I mean, it's wide open casting. You know, you're not going to walk up and fish this, this, you're coming, you're coming upstream this way, but you're going to fish this pool, crouch down below the view line because these fish are so wary and they're all going to be hanging right here in this tongue coming in, you know, looking at the water column. So you're going to, you're going to cast from behind them. And that's where you're going to, that's, that's where I always, you know, I mean, that's where I catch fish and that's probably, you, you might find the same thing, but this is what it looks like. Again, this is a, a one mile below the source. Look at, look at these, these gravel uh, bars that are 10, you know, five to 10 yards across and how wide the creek is right there. I mean, it just gets absolutely incredibly big and wide, big pools that you can wade through and, and uh, you see the gravel here. Um, obviously, the, the flash flooding and the large rains that have taken place um, it scourged this down to bedrock almost in many places. So it's just a, quite a beautiful place uh, to hang out. There's no little brook trout. I know you're probably tired of looking at brook trout, but that's all there is up there that I've ever caught. Uh, pretty little fish. Um, some more of this old growth looking balsams and all this stuff that are back up. See this log jam right here where the river came? And, and, and bunched up here, then shot to the left during a flash flood. It just huge deposits of, but look at the color of that water up there. It's just stunning. And this, and this rock gravel bed right here is very common in the last two and a half miles. Now, when you get to the source of the Raven Fork, it's a place called Three Forks Pool. And I write about this in my book that the legend has it that the chief of the Koala Reservation of the Koala Indians early on back in the, the late 1700s that he would, he and his, his, uh, I guess, braves or maybe his squaws or whatever, they would be up here hunting or whatever. And they would swim in this pool right here because it is quite big. It's in many, it, probably 10, 15 yards across because you have the left fork, the middle fork and the right fork coming into it, feeding it. And it's blown out this big hole right here that's just full of just beautiful crystal water. It's deep. Uh, most of the times you can see the bottom of it, and it, even to the point you can see fish holding on the bottom. And then when it comes out of that, it, of course, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go 16 miles down to the Acona Lufty. Um, but if, you, if you're brave enough to come up here, I, I would challenge you to strip off and jump in there and skinny dip in there and you'll be a better person because of it because that's what the native americans did <laughs> chris that's my story and i'm gonna and I, I just I, it's just a magical place when you get there because you are so isolated when you get in that area but you, you, you get a little jealous of what they experienced right i mean it was it was you know their place their land you you did well okay well here's this is the source now the headwaters it looks something like this. You've got the right fork coming right below the Appalachian Trail, which is a pretty good size creek. The fork is not big. It, it comes, it runs about a mile, opposed to three miles, almost four miles for the right fork. 
But the one you're going to want to fish and take it from me, because I've done both, I've done the right and the left fork. The one you're going to want to fish is going to be this left fork, because it it comes, it runs for five miles um, right below the Appalachian Trail, comes down here, and you will never see, or at least I've never seen east of the Rockies water any cleaner or colder, because it's coming from about 5,600 feet down to 4,200 feet right here. And I have fished up to this this confluence right here of these two other tributaries. I can't remember the names of, but the the, the left fork is the one you're going to fish. That's what it looks like uh, right before it gets to the that that confluence that I told you about, about a mile and a half up. See these drop pools right here? Uh, every one of them hold fish. And uh, if you got the the guts and the stamina and the time to work your way up there, it'll be something that, that, that you'll never forget, even though, you know, this is pretty much what you're going to catch. You might catch a five inch. I never caught anything more than a five inch in there, but generally uh, look at the size of that caddis fly. Chris, don't laugh at me because I caught him with a caddis fly. I caddis know you, fly. But you don't like caddis flies, but that's what I, I, I like them. I just mostly I'm not, I'm not but in love look at them. the size of this fish and look at the size of that fly. And he, 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 he took that fly after three misses. No, after two misses, the third time he got it. And I didn't wait 10 minutes. I just cast it back up there and he hit it again. That's how hungry and aggressive they are up there. Um, now, speaking of bugs, bugs, Chris, talk to us about what these people need to be thinking about as far as bugs. Well, this, this, I, I, love, I like talking about bugs. So let, let's, let's, uh, let's, hit, let's hit a button. Let's press. All right. Uh, so, so one of the things that midges. Listen, fifty percent of a trout's diet is is midges. Uh, so have a good staple of midges. Um, I like to stay kind of in a size twenty kind of scud midge range. Um, on the right hand side here, you see what's called a mats midge. So it's got a, a crystal flash kind of trailing uh, shuck off of it. Can be a great great bug to fish. Uh, and, uh, I, and, and again, have these midges, you can see, these are 22s. Um, I, I don't think you need to go that small on a wild stream. Uh, I, I definitely on something, you know, tell water you would, but on a wild stream, I, 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 you can get away with 18s if you, if you, if you want to, uh, but, but definitely, uh, I'm going to be in the 20 range typically. Chris, this um, this tail on this thing uh, obviously has some iridescence and picks yeah, up just, the ultra, uh, reflects the ultraviolet. Yeah, just a little bit of crystal flash kind of imitates that rising midge and that shuck, right, as that midge is coming up, uh, emerging. Right. Yeah, right. And, and and remember, and remember, folks, a trout can see in the ultraviolet range. So you know, a lot of this crystal stuff and this sparkly stuff. Um, once you get in the lower lower waters, the darker, the deeper waters, those those ultraviolet, uh, the fish can see this ultraviolet spectrum reflecting off that bug. So that's important. All right, next, uh, brook trout. Yeah, so this is again trophy section. So this fish I caught on a on about a size twenty black zebra. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, we, we even fish some smaller bugs here, but you can see down in the bottom left, you, you can just see how shallow and how clear that water is. This is me actually with that fish on, uh, and just taking my time. Uh, when you, when you get a, you know, uh, big fish like this on, you really just need to play it, make sure that you got the right tippet and everything on, uh, in this trophy section, you're going to want to size up a little bit for guys like me that, uh, aren't that great at fishing, uh, sizing up a little bit, isn't going to hurt. Uh, but uh, size 20 zebra uh, is what this guy was on. Sam? Okay. Well, I don't know about this Let's see. Push okay, let's push try, try this again. We're trying to go down. <laughs> push the button. I'm pushing the button. It's not advancing. You got all uh, these other bugs you want to show these people. Wonder why it's not advancing. Well, I can't answer. There you go. How's that? Get it? Oh, there we go. Thank you, Zoom. Okay, great. Another great bug. Uh, listen, on these, you can actually size up. Uh, it, 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 when we talked about straight fork, 
this bug right here on top, this uh, pheasant tail zebra, uh, that, that's what I was fishing and, and actually a size 14. Um, uh, it was my point fly to get down fast. Uh, I had another midge trailing off of it. Uh, but guys, it, you know, these are hard to find if you're a fly tire. Uh, great bug to tie up is having these pheasant tail midges um, with, uh, with a little bit of a hot spot on the butt and the collar. Um, uh, red is a good color uh, to use in these pools uh, or orange. So I'd always have a, a stable of, of those in your box. Sam? Soft tackles, can't go wrong with a soft tackle. Uh, on the left is a CDC soft tackle, pheasant tail. Uh, and then uh, the stingers, uh, these are my flies that I, that, that I came up with. Uh, and these stingers are killer. So size 16 is usually gonna be a great choice. Uh, by, by, and by the way, Chris ties, Chris ties these flies. They're on our site, and these are killers. Yeah, they, ought to be, they ought to be against the law. Sometimes. They're, they, they're, they, they're will, like, they will catch fish when nothing else catches fish. They're like crack, so that's the truth. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite, favorite bugs to fish in the film. So when you see those sipper fish coming up, a uh, little bit flatter water, right uh that like the big open pool where you saw on the raven fork uh this would be a great choice size 20 uh hare's ear uh, that's a starling cape uh, anybody knows about fly tying starling cape on there um and uh great to trail behind your uh, your primary your point dry fly uh and and let this kind of sit in the film and and the trout just eat it up And this is uh, this is a newer fly that that uh, that, that uh, we use, and that is a, a split case, a very simple split case. Uh, anytime you see the mayflies uh, uh, or sulfurs bouncing around in Texas, we call them mayflies, and south we call them sulfurs. But anytime you see those uh, sulfurs uh, bouncing on the water, uh, you you should have some type of yellow split case. That that's what this imitates is that mayfly kind of emerging in that yellow case starting to open up on the back of that of that bug uh, and uh, again great 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 fly good for searching uh, if you're not quite sure Frenchies uh, always have Frenchies uh, again anytime you see sulfurs around um, a lot of times I'll put like a size 12 if, if I'm trying to get down real fast I'll put a 12 I'll put a, even a 10 just a real heavy bug because I want to get down into that drop pool real fast and then I'll trail something smaller off of this just to just to uh, cover the, the water quickly uh, and make sure I'm hitting those different water columns. And this is uh, this is another killer bug, right, Sam? So anytime we see gray, yeah, we see gray skies, uh, we see a little bit of moisture in the air. Uh, you, you're seeing those little gray bugs bounce on the water that look microscopic. Uh, put on a BWO. Um, Remember to watch your, your bead color. So silver, uh, usually going to be pretty good uh, uh, in the, you know, when the, when the sun's out. Uh, gold and copper are going to be pretty good when you have a little bit of murky water. Uh, but uh, BWO, uh, nymph, you're just not going to go wrong with. And typically, I would say 99% of the time, it's going to be a size 20. And as you can see, I fish a lot of jig hook uh, style fishing. And then, of course, sulfur time. So having, you know, uh, Mag Daddy on the left, that is my go to caddis imitation uh, that, that I use. Of course, it's a CDC body, which means you got to have loon loxa and frogs fanny. And if it catches a fish, uh, it's going to get pretty gnarled up. But you know, un, it, that bug is unsinkable. It's pretty unsinkable. You, 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 could, you could tie a monkey wrench on that thing and it would just not about. sink. I've never seen anything like it. Just about um, shake and bake. It's probably the best thing to have, and then a little frog fanny brush uh, with you just to, to comb it out. But uh, you can drop a lot of weight off of this, and it will flat tear the fish up. And of course, uh, I love a yellow uh, uh, Adams, about size 16. Great, great choice. Uh, and then black fly, so you know, always have that uh, caddis, you know, size 16. I'm a, I'm a pretty big size 16, 14, 16, but a lot of 16s. And then a poly wing midge, uh, great, great uh, bug to have on. Yeah, one thing to remember: your top bugs in the you know in the upper sections of this river, especially with the wild fish, you you can you, you, you know you're going to use some some larger 
you know, top water bugs. Yeah, you, know, you can 14, get away with it for sure. Yeah, 12, 14, and 16s on top. You know, these yeah. fish, will, even the small fish will hit them because they're just yeah. very, they're very aggressive. Yeah, good, good point. Yeah. And then, of course, some others. So, you know, Royal, uh, Royal Wolf, uh, uh, Royal Trude. Not many people fish a trude. And not only a Royal Trude, but a Lime Trude. Uh, is a great pattern to have. Adams, you can't go wrong with. And uh, you know, if you're if you're struggling and, and you're not getting any takes, uh, man, pull out that Prince Nymph. Uh, always a good, always a good searching pattern. And then uh, typically six X. Uh, if you're in that trophy section fishing, you know, uh, 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 smaller bugs, it, you you better know how to fight big fish. Uh, because that 6X will break. You may have to go down to some 5X. Don't be afraid to do that, even with a size 20. Uh, I know all the fanatics uh, will have their opinions on all that they can see it. I, I think you can get away with it uh, for sure. Uh, it's all about confidence. Uh, that's why I use a Trout Hunter 6.5X, because it makes me feel better than 7X. Uh, but, um, but, you know, Hannock's a good product. Trout Hunter's a really good product, but I, I, I really use a lot of that Hannock. Uh, yeah, and then rods, man. You know, we're bamboo guys, right, Sam? We have them all, but we like bamboo. But we, we, like, we, we like got bamboo. graphite, too. <laughs> yeah. But, but bamboo we, is kind of our thing. Uh, eight foot, nine foot, ten foot, three, three weights. Good, good for nymphing. Um, and you know, in the non-trophy sections, you, you know, we usually got a seven foot, uh, and a four weight because occasionally you're going to pick up, you're going to be able to pick up some big fish. So you, you need to be, uh, you need to be weighted up a little bit. Exactly. Um, you know, we, we wanted to just let you know, um, local outfitters, we always like to know, let people know where they can get some additional expertise or buy bugs or whatever. But in Cherokee, River's Edge Outfitters is sitting down just north of town on the Oconalefti River. Um, I mean, so it's easy to find it's right there. Those guys are really good guys. Uh, probably no no one fishes that Raven Fork area and the, the Oconalefti more than they do because they, they're on it. And then also down in Bryson City, you got fly fishing the Smokies with Eugene and his team down there. And, and they just, uh, uh, Chris, I know you fished with Eugene on the trophy section uh, one time. I love, I love fishing with Eugene. He'll, just, he'll talk your ear off. He'll, he'll, talk, he'll talk your ear off about everything in the world. But let me tell you what, that boy knows how to fish. He knows how to fish. Uh, and then down uh, also across, almost across the street, Tuscasegee Outfitters number two. Um, which is really a branch store of the Tuscasegee Outfitters Number One over in Silva, which is not far away. And they also have a store down in Waynesville now, which is their third location. So those guys are all good guys, um, and they'll they're they're, they're very helpful. Uh, whether you want to guide or you want to go by and you say, "Hey, what 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 are, what's the water like today on the you know the the, the mid." part of the a Kona lefty or raven fork and you know what what should i fish they're really good at helping you with that type of thing so uh with that said um any any questions or anything feel free to you know pop it in the chat we'll be happy to answer any anything you got i know we've answered quite a few of them answered but... some any any questions type away type away <laughs> We will count. We will count down pretty quick and close this out. So if there's no questions, we will. Hey, don't don't forget to visit Mojo Sportswear website. You'll you'll really like what you see and see some new stuff that um, will really make you we think fish better. And, mm -hmm. and even if you don't fish better, you'll look better. That helps everybody. But Chris, let's really. see, Mark. Best time to go. I gotta be honest with you, Mark. I I like to fish this area. Um, in, in October, November, December, um, you know, it, it is an excellent time to fish. You're going to, you're not going to see as many people out cause it is cold. Um, but, um, it is, it is a wonderful springtime is fantastic. Again, just watch all your weather patterns, um, and make sure your friend when he reserves a campsite at backcountry 47 knows that the, uh, that all the trails are closed at that time of year. Yeah, one thing also, even in the dead of, of summer, when it's hot everywhere else, uh, the, the headwaters 
um, of the Raven Fork, as well as the upper section. That water's coming off of over a mile high. And it's, it, even in the middle of the summer, it's pretty darn cold. So the fish still stay pretty active all the way up there down through the gorge. So if you really want a challenge um, and you're not, you know, you, 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 you want to chase some wild fish, um, do a little hike, hike a couple of miles, and uh, I think you'll be very pleased with what you see. So here's a, here's a, uh, oh, Brian Hazel. Hey, man. How you doing, buddy? Uh, let's see. You might have missed it, but can you park off the road in section one and two, or are there designated areas? Do you remember that, Sam? Yeah, there's parking all, there's parking all up and down um, the, the, the trophy section. Uh, designated and non-designated along along Big Cove Road, and then the flat what we call the 8.8 .8 miles flatland section, all the way up to the confluence of Straight Fork. There's parking places all all along that river, um, and and the, the the Cherokee Indian Nation, the Kuala Indian Nation, has done a pretty good job of making it accessible because they want people to come. You know, so you're not going to have any problem with parking. Um, let's see, Harmon, I, uh, I'm going to come back to you, Harmon, on the fly patterns. Uh, Ryan, when you hiked fish to the Three uh, Forks area, did you camp at 47? Well, the last time we tried to go up there, my good buddy um, who likes to do webinars got a site for us at number 47, but the park was closed. So, <laughs> Who was that? Uh, I think his name's Sam. I don't know him. Yeah, yeah. 47, if you're going to fish that upper section, 47 is kind of the central one you can go to. There, there's another one off of uh, the Enlow Creek Trail um, that um, that's within a mile and a half of that pool that, that we talked about. But you're basically bushwhacking from that campsite down to the water. Uh, so I don't necessarily recommend that. I would I would stick with forty seven. And Damn, as far that, as, that as, far as, as, far that, as camp as far as camping everywhere else, there are dozens and dozens yeah. of commercial and non commercial campsites all up and down the Raven Fort. I think that that hike to forty seven can be a, a bit of a, a grade too, right? You have to be careful in that. Look, it's a two point five mile death march. Yeah, that's all I, I saw. I can it's. The, the Hyatt Creek Trail coming off big uh, off of Straight Fork Road, um, you, you strike you, you you hike up Hyatt Creek and then you turn up uphill and it's it's not an easy hike. It's yeah. going to take you a couple of hours to do that and to get to to Backcountry Campsite 47, and you're going to be winded when you get there because it's a climb up to the ridge where those two trails come together, and then when you pick up uh, Inlow Creek Trail down to the steel bridge you know there's a lot of switchbacks and things like that but um you know you dennis, can... said, uh, dennis said river valley is the best okay yeah good thanks dennis um harman can we share the fly patterns uh well a couple things one is this video is recorded we'll have it you know edited we're uh, sam and i are going to be in uh, west virginia doing some fishing uh this weekend uh but um i'll get the video posted next week um, and uh, it'll have the fly patterns that you can kind of pause and go back to them. But the other thing is a lot of those fly patterns are, are uh, on our website. Uh, you can check them out. Now, some of them, like the split case and all that, I think I've done a video uh, on both the split case and the BWO. Uh, there's a video, I think, on the Mac Daddy, if I'm not mistaken. So a lot of those patterns are, are out there. And, of course, we have just added a huge selection of, of flies that we like. Uh, to our website, uh, great pricing uh, on those flies. Um, really, really nice uh, BWO kind of emerger patterns, PMDs, you name it. Uh, so the, the patterns that you see, you're going to kind of notice, if you know anything about bugs, you're going to see kind of a, a pattern. And that is, is that these are bugs that we know work very well uh, on, on these streams. So uh, Harmon, I hope that helped answer your question if you're still on, uh, but uh, check them out on our website or go to YouTube and check out the Wild Bearings channel and you'll, you'll see a lot of these patterns where I've done some, some uh, videos on, on tying them.
Yeah, all of all all of Chris's tying videos are on there, and and all of these webcasts that we're doing on the waters around uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway, we're, they they'll they'll all they all get posted eventually on there. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. one we did on the Holston River uh, about a month ago, we post it was about a week later when it got posted, but yeah, this it just takes me a week or so to get it edited out. But I'll be a little behind this this week since we're gonna go uh, we're gonna go up to uh, Lewisburg area and and uh, hit. Uh, hit some waters up there. Okay. Any any other questions? We're going to do a countdown here. <laughs> All right. I think. Uh, hey. Let's see. Thank you, but uh, you're you're welcome. Thanks, Ryan. Great questions too. Appreciate your interaction. Uh, and uh, Sam, you want to close this out? Yeah, I'll, I'll close this out. Our, our, the next webcast in um, October will be the Upper Watauga River coming off the north face of Grandfather Mountain and flowing down to the Valley Crucis area, which ends in a delayed harvest, one of North Carolina's newer delayed harvest areas, which is just outstanding fishing. So we're going to, uh, that'll be a, uh, that's one of my favorite places to fish, the upper Watauga. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us. Look forward to seeing you on the Watauga. Mm -hmm.